Hi everyone, uh, welcome, welcome. There is some spaces here and also in the middle. Hopefully we can fit. Otherwise, there is tons of space here by the by the sides. Hi, All right, so I just have 20 minutes and five for questions. I will try my best because I think I have more the slides than the ones I can present because it's a major topic. There is so many things happening. I am very passionate about this industry, so I will try to share that passion in 20 minutes. All right, so let's start. So, uh, as, as Jacob said, I'm Miriam Gonzalez, I'm co-founder of Yochicas. Who attended Yochicas Stakes? Nice, nice. And the rest, next year or wherever you're going, you should go to the next event. So, let's start with this one. So, I think this is a beautiful example of uh, one of the first pictures that was taken from Apollo 8, if I remember correctly, and the name is Air Rise. So, there, are some, there were some pictures before of these ones. Uh, we cannot say at that time air observation yet because it was kind of the early stages of the space industry. But I mean, seeing this is when everybody saw how fragile and beautiful is, is Earth. This was taken from the moon mission in, in 68. But actually, the first satellite that was launched in space was in 57, and it was from the, uh, at that time, the Soviet Union. So it was the Sputnik. I'm not sure if I can share a bit of the sound, maybe. Let's, let's try. And it wasn't, oh, no. Security, no, no. Anyway, I can share the slides and you can hear the sound uh, later. So this was actually the first satellite artificial uh, around orbiting Earth, and this one was one of the major facts that push what we call the space race, because one year after that, the President Eisenhower in the USA decided to create NASA, because they knew how important it was to be also present in space. So anyway, let's focus right now a bit of air observation numbers. So at this moment, there are around 10,000 satellites orbiting Earth. From those almost 10,000, uh, around 1,000 are for air observation, uh, and then, it's kind of like the second uh, layer of, uh, of number of satellites. First is communication, second is our observation, and there are, of course, some other ones. Uh, last year, in 2023, uh, there were 223 launches, and can you imagine that a few years before, I mean, it was almost like half of this number. So it's crazy how this keeps growing, how this keeps being a big topic right now, and around 70 plus countries are right now involved in air observation satellites at this moment. So. But you hear a lot about the space industry and also you hear a lot about new space industry. What's the difference? I mean, you can check in different sources. Uh, the definition, from my point of view, is mostly about these points. Is the size of satellite has been reduced so much to even have the size of a loaf of bread as the planet satellites. Is CubeSats pretty small? Is the space startups are coming more and more uh, in, the, in the game, in, in the economies? The, the cost also for launching has been going lower and lower, and as you may know, it's a per kilo a price, so because everything is coming so small, now the price is so much uh, lower. So also something very important is I do partnerships in space tech, so I have so many conversations in the last years with the space tech companies, so you see also a lot of these public and private partnerships, and of course, companies doing all this disruption. Uh, of course, I mean, we see what's happening with the SpaceX. I mean, right now they are the ones launching uh, most of the space rides, I mean, to space, and so many, so many other things. So I show here some other numbers uh, regarding spa space startups and also the collection of imagery. And if you want to see the full report, I also share here the link because there is so many interesting data about what is happening also with new space. So we can say that new space is what's happening today with all this cost and uh, private invest investment and also more and more commercial use cases happening in the industry versus the previous uh, kind of like normal space industry, let's say it that way, it was mo more focused in defense, it was more focused in government, it was more focused in large corporations, and right now even small companies are participating. So, in some other studies, you see that space technologies and also the space industry has a forecast for 2035 of being 1.8 trillion opportunity in the global economic 
because of many reasons, because of the use cases, because of the climate change also investment, because of the carbon uh, projects, because of the launches, because of the hardware, because of the software, because of so many things, and also invite you to check this, this report that you can find also online. So now let's go back a bit about what is happening today in the industry. And this talk, uh, I decided to make this talk because back in, uh, in Kosovo uh, last year, I saw how, I mean, we are, I mean, we are an open source and open data communities right here, and then uh, we are more used to hear about the Copernicus program, about Landsat, but also there is so much happening in the commercial uh, part, and also working together with ESA and other organizations. So I thought it was important for people to have visibility about the new players in this industry. If I'm speaking too fast, let me know because I'm thinking about my 20 minutes right here. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. So anyway, uh, if you might know, I mean, there is mainly like optical and SAR. Uh, for the ones who don't know, optical is more about a passive uh, sensor, and SAR is an active sensor. What that means is that for optical, we need the light of the sun to be able to reflect the energies. In the case of, uh, of SAR, uh, it's an active sensor that is sending this scatter, and then it's getting us... Uh, uh, a signal back, and that's how also, I mean, this, I mean, in summary for reaching my 20 minutes of presentation. And so what is happening right now in the commercial sector? So we have all these companies right now uh, doing really cool things. So let me share with you a few of the sensors they are having. So uh, in kind of overall multispectral, we have uh, Black Sky from the USA, Axel Space from Japan, Turksat from, uh, from Turkey, we have uh, 2180 from China, uh, IMAS, uh, satellite, IMAS Sat, uh, International, they are from Israel, Yosat from Spain, SIIS from Korea, Satellogic, Uruguay, Netherlands, USA kind of thing, uh, Open Cosmos from the UK and Planet, uh, uh, USA, a bit Germany. And all these companies, they are having right now resolutions coming from 30 centimeters. So they have 30, they have 50, they have 70, they have 90, and all of them right now, I mean, are kind of really active, and they have different projects. Also, Satellite has a different, uh, right now, a, a new project, and the one they are releasing also open data. So let's go for that a bit further. Uh, the next ones I want to show you is Something that I found really interesting because I would say in the past uh, you hear a lot about the importance of hyperspectral and until the last couple of years you are hearing more and more about all these commercial players launching and being pretty active. So let me share with you these four names that I think they are pretty interesting. Wyvern is a company from Canada and they have five meter multispectra. They have what is called the Dragonets, that's the name of their satellites. And uh, they are doing something very unique because they really want to have accessible pricing for hyperspectral. And how they are doing this is that they consider themselves a satellite company, but what they are doing is they are having companies like Love Orbital and also like ACC Clyde uh, Space for actually uh, kind of like bringing the payload in the satellite that somebody else has built and put it to space. So that will be making like the low, the price of the, the, the images like go really low. Uh, another company which I found very interesting is Pixel. Uh, they have this five meter resolution too. And this is a company from India and USA. And what they are doing is uh, they are also launching, uh, they are already launching, I believe. And they say that they will be able to reach more than 200 bands. So that's also something, I mean, right now they haven't achieved that goal yet, but that's something that will be coming. Albedo, from the US, uh, they will be having this, uh, these images with 10 centimeter resolution. The thing about Albedo is that they have this agreement in the one they have exclusivity with just one platform, and then after that they will be having deals with more companies. And Cuba, Cuba Space, another company which is doing more about the satellite together with analytics, and they want to focus in agriculture. So I see that uh, time goes really fast, so let me, let me go to the next one. Another topic very important is thermal. Uh, we see what is happening with climate change, we see what is happening right now with different countries in the world. So we have these three companies, 
Oratec from Germany, Satbu from the UK, and also Constel uh, R. Oratec, uh, they just signed this agreement with uh, the government of Greece to be able to provide all this information about what is happening in Greece and be ahead of the core for any wildfire that may be presented. And we know how they have been suffering over the last couple of years with this. Satbu, uh, they are doing more about heat islands. It launched a satellite uh, last year, and then in December, we received the news that there was no further communication with the satellite. So that was pretty sad because they were doing amazing, amazing things. So next year, they will be launching the satellite, the new one, and that will be, I think, mid-2025. And constantly, are, they are doing things with mo mostly agriculture. Uh, another very interesting players are the methane satellites. Uh, one of them is GSGSAT, a company from uh, Canada, and also uh, MethaneSat. So they are already uh, detecting all these leaks all around the globe. And some of the models they are following is kind of like subscriptions in the one they are monitoring four, ten, one hundred uh, sites around the globe to be able to, to see what is happening. MethaneSat uh, is a new company. They just launched a few months ago and they are calibrating uh, right now. They are from the US and they have all this funding. And at the beginning, the, what they wanted to do was uh, having open data. So the last time I spoke with them, they were trying to see how much open data they will be having and maybe they will have some other business models. So I'm curious about what they will be developing. SAR, uh, we have so many SAR uh, providers right now in commercial uh, markets, so I found so interesting uh, these opportunities right here. We know SAR, I mean, can go through clouds, doesn't matter the, the, the weather, it can go through the night, it can detect so many things. The funny thing is that, well, not so funny, uh, I was in the SAR symposium uh, two years ago in Berlin, and one uh, uh, professor and researcher, he has been, I think, 20 years doing SAR research, and when he, uh, when he like joined the podium, he said, I have been doing SAR for 20 years, and I am still not know what I'm seeing. So that means, I mean, how complicated it can be SAR. And all these companies, they are trying their best to also be like vocal about the use of SAR, the, uses, the use cases and everything, but I still, we still have a long way to go to understand SAR uh, much better. These companies, some of them are from USA, uh, from Japan, uh, from, uh, yes, and one from Canada, and they are doing also really cool things, and I will share a bit more later. This one also I found so interesting. These companies are building, uh, the first one, New View, uh, the first uh, global uh, LiDAR kind of like archive of the, of the world. So they will be launching in 2025 the first proof of, proof of concept named Mr. Spock, that's the satellite. And then the second one, uh, I know, it's, it's funny the name, uh, Array Labs, uh, they are doing this kind of like type of SAR and they're also trying to have a 3D uh, high resolution digital globe. Uh, so that they are going to be launching, I think, in two years, if I remember correctly. So all these companies is, uh, I suggest you to check what is happening, uh, keep the newsletters, I mean, in your inbox because I think, I mean, cool things are happening right there. And the ones I want to also share with you is these companies doing what I mentioned before in the one. They are saying, I can give you space data as a service. So tell me what sensor you need. I will build it. I will say it's yours, uh, it's your payload, but I will have a chance to have maybe part of the data you want to acquire. And then we can say you have already satellite in space, even you didn't build it, even it's not your infrastructure. So that's also something very disruptive regarding cost for the data you will be acquiring with companies working with these guys right here. Anyway, and let us not forget the other players. I mean, Airbus and Maxar are major players, of course. Uh, I would say they are from kind of a mix, I would say from the older space industry and the new one because also they are developing many new things, but I would say they are more like established big companies. So. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was so hard to acquire data. It was so hard. You need to go to each of the companies, sign an agreement, having at, at least a million euro in your pocket to be able to knock one door and be listened. So I would say right now, I mean, thanks to all these platforms and marketplaces and the special hubs, you have the opportunity of having maybe smaller budgets, do a proof of concept on something else. You have companies like O42, SkyFi, Apollo Mapping, SkyWatch, uh, companies 
one of them is from Germany, uh, from the US, from Canada, uh, and then, oh shoot, okay. <laughs> okay, so check these platforms, you can find many cool things there and also open data, so please feel free to, to use those. Anyway, so something I'm very proud is that uh, two months ago we had in Berlin the tasking sprint organized by Element, uh, Element 84 and also I was at the time working in for it too. And we did this tasking sprint uh, organized by, by us together, especially leading by Element 84. So there's so many things happening regarding also how every single company uh, has the metadata. So how can you make all the data having the interoperability needed to be able to create products? So companies as Planet, Open Cosmos, Black Sky, uh, LiveVO42, uh, Satellite, we're here doing all these discussions, and then a lot of community work, and also so many people committed to FOSS, they were there. So it's not only about the commercial, it's also about how even in commercial environments we can work together with all these, all these things that are specifications to be able to work together, and then maybe in the future they will become standards if they are adopted by the industry. Okay, so I have just a few minutes. Spaceports, uh, two very important ones happening, uh, Andoya, Norway, and also one in Strange in Sweden. I'm very happy to see this happening in the next year or so. Uh, of course, I mean, next um, uh, July 9th, we're going to be see Ariane 6 launching. That's uh, one of the first after the last uh, issue with Vega uh, a couple of years ago. So very happy to see that. And Isa, so I'm not sure if you saw this T-shirt. I mean, I love it. I mean, uh, and Isa is doing so many things also regarding how they can support having data coming from the commercial companies. So I really suggest you to check the network of resources and then uh, check what these companies are offering. So you will have 5,000 uh, euros in the ones you can see all this data uh, for research, educational, pre-commercial, and you can build something. So if you need, I think, more than 5,000, you can also uh, send an email to them and say that you need more, or maybe you can also have your own budget additional to the 5,000 euros. So. I think uh, some of my colleagues from Up42 also, they are very involved with that, so let me, let me know. And open data programs, so something I really, really admire about this is we were speaking about how SAR is complicated. So there are so many, already some programs regarding open data, like the Capella program, uh, there is an open data also from Maxar supporting in a certain point humanitarian open street map. I'm not sure where is that right now. But one of the projects I really admire the most is Umbra. Four million dollars equivalents of open data available from them. So the first part of the project was one million and then in March they announced four million. I am waiting for the 10 million announcement, I tell you that, because I think it would be happening pretty soon. So that's how these companies are having this commitment about the open data program. So I really think I mean, more people should be like digging their hands in and see what else they can develop with SAR. So let's not forget about, of course, the Copernicus program because, of, I mean, it's nice to have these options with commercial, but then the most stable and most supported programs right now, of course, is Copernicus and, and Landsat. So let's not forget about how we can combine the open data from the Copernicus program, Landsat, together with commercial data. So my wish list uh, for this is I want to see more open data programs available from commercial companies. I, I would love to see more Umbras happening in different companies, in more optical, in more hyperspectral, in more... I would love to see more open license because actually the program from Umbra is a Creative Commons 4.0, so I would love to see also more of that uh, available. Space agencies, I want to see more of that working together with more platforms so they don't reinvent the wheel every five years, every five, six years, another platform, another thing. So how can you have a mid or long term goal to be able to have the access of all this data? And of course, I would love to see more communities, I mean, having more the hands involved in all these projects because I think they need to hear more about what is happening in these companies and also together it will be, of course, I mean, stronger. So I think I made it. So thanks so much. Uh, and then if you have any questions, I'm around. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 
uh, Miriam for this uh, really good introduction where the data actually comes from and now we have the chance to answer some questions. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. I am Sultan, Saudi Arabia. I like to know uh, real-time monitoring. This is my, um, my, my, my subject is about to know how many satellites, this, there is a program to study how many satellites revisiting the site. Say, for example, in Tartu now. And uh, I like to study phenomena of real timing, either in the city in real time, or, okay. or agriculture. Yes. Is there is a program to tell me how many satellites visiting the site? Uh, because I like to do consequences. Like yeah, system, uh, system. I think there are a few websites in the ones they are showing you. I mean, not exactly Tartu, but kind of the areas yeah, they place, are capturing. Yeah. And, uh, let me check the names and I can share that with you. Yeah. But also, I mean, real, real time is relative because satellite is capturing right now and then it will go up, it will get some thing and then it will be going to the Grand Station and then yeah, get downloaded. Yeah, different resolution, no problem. But I like to study, uh, for, uh, you know, to see because there is many sensors visiting a site. Uh -huh. There is a program, you know, you know some program. I think there is a website that is showing, but not specifically like the city. It's more a no, no, showing I mean around where it is. I can check it to you and share Thank with you, you later. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All Any right. other questions? Uh, so there are only a few uh, spaceports, right, that uh, you know bring the uh, payloads up to the space. So are these spaceports sub more or less controlled on what specific satellites they can, you know, allow to bring into space? I would say right now the most used uh, spaceport is uh, Vandenberg in California. Is the one used uh, by SpaceX? As they are the one also right now using for all launches. And I would say in the short term, medium term, I mean, you are going to be see more about uh, Andoya in Norway and also about the one in Sweden. There are also two more uh, in the UK, one in Glasgow and, uh, no, sorry, in the Shetland Islands and also one in Cornwall that also they are being prepared, I mean, when we speak. And the other ones are in China and, of course, in Russia, but I mean, I'm not speaking about those because I'm focusing right now in Europe. But the one used by everyone today is the one in Vandenberg. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just check it? Yeah. yeah, one more question about small satellite for remote sensing. I don't see any of your slides uh, mentioning about small satellite like nanosats. CubeSat. There is they were mentioned already. Other, all the uh, companies, most of them, they are having small satellites. Did you mention that in your? Uh, I, I didn't mention, but I mean, I should have mentioned that that most of the companies I am right now uh, showcasing in my slides, most of them are small satellites or CubeSats. Uh, like Planet, maybe. Like yeah, me, okay. most of them. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Miriam. That was really inspiring Thank you. And, and, and interesting, above all. Um, this is the first FOSPOR-G that I attend after 11 years, where we start talking about security, mm, seriously. Okay. Mm. And I would like to hear from you, how is this community uh, approaching that, given that we are starting to hear concrete threats concrete risks to all these missions out there in mm, space? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. And uh, to be honest, I don't have a, a full answer because also it's so secret, I mean, what is happening that I would say we are not aware about all the threats that all these companies are receiving. So I, I heard about kind of like non-official things about th how things have increased uh, starting the war of Ukraine. And of course, right now with the Middle East, I would say crisis, how these companies also are having certain things happening and threats, but there is no official information shared because they don't want to make it public. Yeah, so the community at, at this moment, I would say we are not doing much because also the lack of information, but I would say that it's important to be, to be knowledgeable, but if you are not working in the company in the inside, you need probably to fill a lot of NDAs to be able to have, I mean, maybe also projects inside to be able to have this information. So, unfortunately, I'm not in there. All right, one more question. So, thank you for your presentation. It was, uh, it was really great, but uh, I have one comment. Uh, 
what what I'm missing in this presentation it was uh, Copernicus data space ecosystem because it provides uh, something yeah. like I think 50 petabytes of data yeah so I think yeah. that in the next presentation it would be worth to mention about it yeah uh, as I said I'm not uh, I'm not attacking you yeah it was yeah. a really good presentation but uh, I think it's uh, for now in this very moment it's a main source of uh, Copernicus data, so it's it's worth to mention it. No, no, no totally, uh, totally agree with that. So, in my last presentation, I saw that there was not enough uh, knowledge about commercial satellites, commercial companies. That's what I decided to focus because I think community knows more about what's happening in Copernicus, but they don't know what's happening with the other companies. So, but that's a good point. Thanks so much. Maybe next year. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Miriam. Um,